Uh, hey everybody, it's Richard Harris and Scott Lease here with another edition of the Surfing Sales Podcast. We are joined today uh, by Kyle Coleman, the VP of Revenue Growth and Enablement. And the best part about this, before I welcome him, is that he actually just told us before we hit record that he's never misspoken before. So we're really excited to hear this perfect, perfect conversation today. Uh, it's like a perfect phone call if you want to think about it. So the pressure is on. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. So my, my first my first question is, I just heard Richard say your title, and I have no idea what you do. Thank you. I like to keep it that way. Yeah. So job well done in the mystery. Can you explain to everybody what it is you do at Clarity? What does revenue growth and enablement mean, at least to you guys? Yeah. So at Clarity, I, I've been here for about a year now, just over a year. And what we've tried to do is really not create silos, but instead allow different departments to really focus on what their superpowers are. What is the main intention of what they're trying to do for the company? So what we've done is we've created a new department, this growth department that sits right between marketing and sales so that our marketing people can focus on brand and content and design and product marketing, positioning and messaging. And our sales team can focus on closing business. What our growth team focuses on is creating pipeline and creating the programs to accelerate and close that pipeline. So deal acceleration programs with field marketing, demand gen programs to get people in the door, enablement programs to make sure that our sales team knows what and how to do their job. That is all consolidated in a single department that we call growth. So we are responsible for the entire pipeline number for the whole company, marketing sourced, SDR sourced as well as sales sourced because we have all these disparate functions consolidated onto a single team. So then why does, why do you have a marketing department? I'm confused. So our marketing team focuses on all the brand stuff. They can focus on building out the brand, uh, the messaging, the, all the AR and PR, all the content marketing. They take care of all of that. What I have on our growth team is demand generation, field marketing, sales development, and enablement. So our demand gen team is the one who comes up with the tactics to activate all of the content that our marketing team creates. And then of course the SDR team is qualifying all the leads that demand gen uh, brings in. And then we hand them off to the sales team to run the cycle. So, so Scott and I are big proponents of, of marketing owning a revenue number, right? Um, and I can see with the way you guys have laid this out, which is really cool and different. Um, does marketing have a number? What are they, without getting the base compensation, are they still looking at MQL? Like what are they, what are they driving? Yeah, it's a really good question, Richard. And there's so many different success metrics that you can pursue uh, on a marketing team. Um, probably one of the most nebulous ones. Three. Yeah. One of the <laughs> awareness is means something different to every single marketer you'll ever talk to, but that doesn't make it less important. So tracking the number of LinkedIn followers we have and website visitors we have and all the different things, you know, subscribe, uh, people who subscribe to our blog post, all those types of little indicators are kind of miniature versions of success metrics. But to Scott, answer your question, we can, do that. we can absolutely drive LinkedIn people. Yeah. Like, perfect. There you go. Like, come on. Where do I sign? How much, That's how much hard. can we pay you? Yeah. Um, hire, like if they can't figure that out next, so, okay. So, so, awareness so to, answer, to answer your question, the, the real thing that our marketing team uses and our growth team uses for that matter to evaluate success is sales qualified pipeline. So we don't own, you know, obviously we're, we're very much involved in the actual closing of business and the revenue targets that our sales team pursues, but our success is further up the funnel and it's that qualified pipeline. So not pipeline that's created by the SDR team or created by uh, demand gen marketing efforts, but actually the first meeting has to happen and the qualification criteria need to be satisfied and the salesperson needs to accept that pipeline or that, that deal into their pipeline. And that is what is success for our marketing team. So then we can say this piece of content that our, our content marketers created and that our demand gen team activated led to X amount of dollars in qualified pipeline how do, you, how do you get that down to the deal level? I mean, that's great. It sounds great on paper. Yep. How do you get it to the deal level? It's all about the marketing ops and sales ops plumbing that exists kind of behind the scenes that allows for this type of analysis. And we use our own product for a lot of this type of analysis. So we're able to see uh, what is driving what and, and be really super granular about it. But give me more. Like, don't tell me about your plumbing. I got plumbing too. Like, you know, I want what I, what I really want. I'm giving you a hard time on purpose, but is for the people who are listening going, oh, that's a really cool 
how do they do that? Like what, like aside from Clary, like we know it's not, this is not a product pitch show. Mm -hmm. What are the things that you're trying to measure in there? What are, are there, are there tools that you guys use that you recommend for folks? You know, honestly, Richard, it's, it's less about the tools and it's certainly not about Clary because you can do all of this type of analysis within your CRM, whether that's Salesforce or Dynamics or whatever it is. It really is about the operational rigor that you have set up. And I know it's not the sexiest topic in the world, and I'm certainly not an expert in it either, but the sales ops and marketing ops, what we call revenue operations, kind of um, the, the, the structure that exists so that when somebody comes in and downloads this piece of content, all of that information is tied both to at the contact level and then translates over to the opportunity level so that we can consolidate all of this analysis on the opportunity and be really prescriptive about what came from where and what's working and what isn't and where the ROI is. That's what I'm looking for. Thank you. Yeah. My, uh, my favorite part of your, your background, at least as of right now, is the fact that you also have a psychology degree like I yes. do. I'm curious because I'm older than you are. It's, when I was getting a psychology degree, nobody was talking about, oh, this is like a really good thing to do and study if you're gonna go into business and into sales. I'm, I'm curious, why did you study psychology? Was there any part of you that was like, this will actually be really good to help me understand people and motivation and, and whatnot, and then go apply it into business? Or did you just happen to kind of get into sales more like, more like I did? I wish I could say that I had that level of foresight when I was 16, 17 years old, Scott. I wish I could tell you that was the case. Honestly, it was just something that was interesting to me. Um, I am a answer that I give all the time. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm, a, I'm a middle child, so I've been mediating my entire life. I've always been sort of inclined to be interested in human psychology, specifically in sort of mediating conflict. Um, so I just thought it was an interesting sort of thing for me to pursue and then learn a bit more about. And then as I got deeper into it and studied, uh, you know, not like psychiatry, but more behavioral economics type of psychology, I was like, oh, this really makes a lot of sense yeah. for the business world. So I started to realize more in during my college career, but I had no idea going in. Yeah, I think it, it's, you probably agree, but I think it's been really helpful in my, in my career to have just some, <clears throat> some basic understanding of some of these principles and have lived through it and even the conflict mediation stuff that you're talking about as a middle child, like Lord knows that everybody in a leadership position is, is managing conflict all the time, whether it's, you know, under you, next to you, side to side, above you, all of those kind of things. I just, I just see it as there's no difference between being a middle manager and a middle child, right? <laughs> It's, it's so true. And I, I joke all the time that this, uh, this middle child syndrome of mine is what drove me to be so interested and so well disposed at the SDR job, being that bridge right between sales and marketing, and having to develop a fluency of language in both sales and marketing to be able to be, you know, be the one who's connecting them, solving conflict, ensuring that they know like, hey, we're all on the same team here, all part of the same family, like, it's going to be okay. Here's how what the left hand is doing is helping the right. And so I've always just been naturally inclined to be right in the middle and I've taken it to a whole different level here at Clary now being this growth department that is you give it, I think you've given the all, the, all the middle children of the world who are in sales and marketing are finally going, mm -hmm. now I know how to use this. Right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> all that torture I received, <laughs> all that pain I experienced, I know how to spend this. This is really cool. So uh, I want to know, I want to know more about your, uh, personal branding game, which has, for me at least, kind of uh, been a bit of a rocket ship. Like you kind of came out of nowhere a little bit. And now all of a sudden, you know, you're posting super consistently, getting truckloads of, of engagement. Um, and I like this post that you made the other day where you kind of shared your formula and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I like it because I don't do it. And, and what I mean by that is it made me pause and think and be like, fuck, I wonder if this guy's figured something out that I could apply to my own game. Because I have, you know, and Richard has as well, like significant following on, on, and presence on LinkedIn. And I'm specifically talking about, I'm curious what Richard thinks. 
I'm, I'm specifically talking about Kyle's use of emojis. <laughs> I've never seen so many posts, so many emojis in them before. So why, why is that Ooh. working, do you think? Why is it working? So I, a few things, if I, if I may kind of um, go back in time a little bit here to, to frame yeah. this up a little. Um, I realized probably at the end of last year that I was feeling busy, very busy, but not always productive. And I thought that a way to sort of counter this would, would to be, was to be very intentional about setting time aside to think. No computer, no screen, no nothing, just pen and paper, sit down for 30 minutes and just think and write. And so I set myself a little uh, you know, New Year's resolution, a little challenge to think and write for half an hour a day. And it turns out the only thing I think and write about is work related. <laughs> so I would, <laughs> it's kind of sad, but it's true. And, you know, I, I ended up just sitting down and, and thinking about a few different things I was passionate about, experienced in, had at least a, a certain level of expertise in, and just fleshing out a bunch of different ideas as I sat and thought I found it therapeutic to be able to do this. And obviously LinkedIn is a perfect outlet to transmit these types of thoughts uh, out into the world. But before I did that, I studied you two. I studied people uh, like Colin Cadmus, like Josh Braun, a few of the other people that I think do a pretty good job on LinkedIn and understood what, what are you guys doing that makes you successful and, and, and then engage with your content and engage with the commenters in your content and saw like, what, what are people responding to? What, what is, is there a formula here? What can we do to, to, you know, to maximize my own engagement? So I did a good you know, three to four weeks of just listening and, and going out and, and kind of probing um, and seeing what was working before I, I tried my hand at it myself. Which and is, then, which is very smart and the right way, the right way to do it. And the, the way that myself and some of the other people you talk about kind of teach people. Totally. Right? Totally. And, and, and it completely worked. Yeah. yeah. And, and the other thing I would say is, you know, again, having spent eight plus years in this SDR orbit, there are so many parallels between writing a good outbound email and writing an effective LinkedIn post that a lot of it really translated nicely, like short, crisp, snappy sentences, a lot of white space, make it easy to read, easy to digest. Um, and the emoji thing is just something I have fun with. I think that a lot of times I like to do bullet lists, but bullet points look terrible in LinkedIn posts. And so I like to have a little fun with the emojis. So, I, so here's the thing. I think that Kyle is the, is the male version of Sarah Brazier, right? Like they, <laughs> They're they the got the emoji. emoji. Those two own the emoji game on on LinkedIn. So, but but there's something to be said too because this is the part where it's like Scott, you and I get so wrapped up in the way we do things that it's like, oh, you know, look at that creative thing. Like today, yeah. I think was the first time I actually wrote a post today um, using an emoji, and and truthfully, you know, it was the poop emoji. So I'm I'm impressed that it uh, hasn't gotten taken down. Um, <laughs> super excited for this. You know, it's it's actually doing pretty well in four hours. It's got like 8,000 views. So I'm pretty happy about it, but, but it's making me go, okay, how do I do this? And then of course I also have to look at it or I don't have to, but I do my own, you know, I suffer from imposter syndrome too. I'm like, I'm like, okay, how do I do this and not try to look like a tool, right? How do I not look like some Gen Xer trying to be cool and, you know, you know, trying to do something that's not true to his, nature right or perceived nature so so i love that you're doing it and i love that it's fresh and it's different and i also yeah. think particularly the last 45 days uh, and I, i've been saying this for years and so has scott is that linkedin's become way more facebook and facebook has become way more linkedin mm -hmm. right um and and i think people are just starting to share parts of their life and their world that they just didn't used to share as much yeah. um and Good, bad, or otherwise, I don't know if that's what what that outcome will be. Um, there's certainly more noise, but I, you know, the yeah, creativity yeah. is what matters, and I think it's. Yeah, you're, and I, I, I love it, and I, I'm kidding and saying <laughs> saying it with love that you know I don't I don't do the emoji thing, and I haven't done it, and so I see Kyle doing it, and I'm like, shit, I need to take a look at my own situation. Maybe there's something there. Um, well, my, my audience. audience that doesn't mean that I'll do it though. I mean, I'll do it. Like people have been time. saying that about video forever. People yeah. have been saying about video forever, and I don't do videos. 
Yeah. Right. So what, what, in, um, Richard, what might make you feel better is that my inspiration for the emoji thing was actually my, uh, Clary's VP of product marketing. Her name is Hila. She's a 40 something, uh, Israeli woman, you know, a mother of 16 year olds. And she was the one who, who I saw using emojis for the first time, because it's what her kids do when they, when they text her, she was like, this is just the way I've gotten used to messaging now. And it seems to be working pretty well for me. So why don't you try it out? And then my audience for the most part are, you know, younger. They're, they're SDRs or, or younger salespeople who this is the way they communicate. And so, so you're, you got to. You're, you're writing all these posts from your mobile phone then? No, no. You can get the emoji keyboard on your, on your Mac. I have no idea how to do that. Uh, we, we'll yeah. talk offline about keyboard you're shortcuts, so Scott. I'm so useless, I think. <laughs> right. This is, this, is the, this is the part where we're like, oh, yeah, we're Gen X. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't, even, I didn't even think that this you is could the do part, that. This I'm is the part where, where Kyle adds tons of value to my life. Right. And he, yeah. he's going go to go like some, he, like, his next like, post tomorrow is going to be full of emojis. And it's going to be like the day that I taught Scott and Richard what an emoji keyboard was. <laughs> yeah. I get to use the right. old man emoji. I get to use the dinosaur emoji. This is going to be great. Yes, you can broken bone, old man, all of that stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah one, one other thing. And, oh, and I think this is important for anybody who's trying to, to, you know, do this, have a presence on LinkedIn. And I, I think you guys will agree with this is like, you got to be authentic and to be authentic, you have to be posting about things that you actually know about. <laughs> this is, I know it sounds so obvious, but one of my main motivators again, in, in doing this and putting myself out there was I saw bad advice getting shared in my internal company Slack channel from people who had no idea what they were talking about, had no credentials. Can you, men can you mention some of that bad advice? Um, there's you don't, some have to, bad... you don't have to mention, don't, you don't have to mention the people, but like one of the things that I keep seeing as a trend is like people saying, Oh, there's bad advice out there and don't listen to these particular people saying this. So, but nobody ever says like what the bad advice was. So can you say like what the bad advice was? Yeah. So some of the, um, some of, the, and it's bad in my opinion. So bear that in mind. Um, there is, I've seen some things, again, shared in internal company Slack channels, which is kind of strange, but championing the, uh, the virtues of sandbagging deals, sandbagging opportunities as an SDR or as an AE and saying that, you know, by doing this, you're, you're pulling a fast one. If your company's comp plan is not good enough, then you should sandbag your deals and you should kick them to next quarter. And then, you know, you're, you're going to be better off because you're setting yourself up for success next quarter. And it's, you know, I, I understand that there's, there's probably an argument to be made here. We could debate the, the virtues of that or not. But what's so interesting is this COVID uh, crisis has really shown a spotlight on why you should never send back deals because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. That's like if right. you can get something in the door, get it in the damn door. Yeah. So seeing people like have that kind of mindset is um, counterproductive, I, I think, in their own professional growth. But hold on. What about, doesn't that also, and I'm not saying you should stand back, so don't, don't misinterpret, but I can see the other point of view is that, wait, why did management build such a shitty comp plan? Or is it that all comp plans inherently do that? Like there's no way to not have a sandbagging moment in your comp plan. But to me, that's a, that's a more important question um, than, than the revenue. Um, particularly when I see the way SDRs are, still being mistreated from a compensation standpoint, right? You got overinflated salaries of AEs who, you know, think they're too good to pick up the phone and do the hardest part of the job. And then you're going to try nickel and diamonds, you know, you pretend like overpaying the SDR is going to make you go bankrupt right, right. when it's having an overinflated AE payroll system, you know? So I'm not saying, I'm not advocating for sandbagging, but I am advocating for those managers to kind of step back and look at yourselves and go, wait a minute, is our comp plan good. And I also think too, because of COVID, people are taking a look at their comp plan, right? We do need to be more fair. Mm -hmm. We need to be reasonable. Unfortunately, I don't know that it's altruistic as much as it is board related, right? It's true. But I'll, I'll take what I can get to your point of, hey, if I can get the deal this way, then I'll do it. So right. Right. Yeah. I hopefully side of that. Yeah. Yeah. The right approach, I think Richard is, is so, you know, bring in as much as you can bring in and hopefully you can trust your management, your leadership to do the right thing and, and to adjust the comp plans in a way that is fair. Um, that would be the, the advice that I would give to people is, you know, try and 
be the change agent, try and influence things easier, probably at a smaller company. Just out of curiosity, can you talk about your comp plan for SDRs that prevents that? Yeah. So we have, uh, I mean, we have accelerators that I, I, we don't have any cliffs and we don't, and we have accelerators. So a lot of companies will pay, it's kind of strange, but they'll pay $0 for SDR output until they hit a certain threshold. Uh, we don't do any of that. We pay every single opportunity, every qualified opportunity that comes in, we pay for. And then once they surpass quota, there's a couple different acceleration tiers that they can hit to incentivize overperformance. Great. Love it. Thank you. Yep. And then there's a kicker for closed business as well. Um, so That's the other ones. Yep. Yep. And there's no such thing as a perfect comp plan, though, at least that I've never seen. Okay. <clears throat> you, you put... You put any comp plan into the hands of any type of salesperson and sales rep. I'll find the loophole. And all they're doing is trying to figure out how they can get one over on you. Totally. Right? And, and, and there are whole... really better versions than others. But is yeah. there a, a flawless, foolproof one? I don't think so. Right. right. And that's, you know, you're right. And I understand that an SDR at the end of the quarter for us, because we do quarterly comp plans as well and not monthly. And I, I'm, I feel pretty strongly about this as well, but we can talk about that in a second. Um, there are situations where if they're not going to hit quota this quarter, they may feel like, you know what, why don't I just get off to a strong start next quarter? And so there's always game ability uh, within comp plans. Nothing is perfect. But the, you just have to, as a leader, communicate as much context as you can as possible about why comp plans are designed the way they are and be open to feedback and open to change that I think is the, the right kind of balance to strike. Yeah. What, is, what are some of the differences in your experience managing these SDRs versus managing some of the other people that are underneath you like a AE or demand gen resource or I'm not even sure all the different types of roles that report up to you but I'd love to hear about some of those differences because I I'm dealing, I've dealt with this many times before and I'm dealing with it again right now um, with this company that I'm helping. I'm always curious to try to hear how other people are managing the subtle differences in skill sets and personality and experience between some of these roles. Yeah, it's a really interesting. SDRs are so interesting because I've never found, and maybe, uh, you know, Richard or Scott, I'm, I'm off base on this. I've never found a quote unquote hiring profile that fits for SDRs. I've hired yeah. people with all sorts of crazy backgrounds from, you know, from like that. yeah, exactly. You know, people who worked in radio as radio producers and lawyers and used car salesmen and um, all sorts of things that, you know, kind of, sort of you think would translate, but it's not what some sales leaders look for when they're like, they have to have X number of years of sales experience on their resume or I'm throwing it out the window. I've never subscribed to that. So as a result, and part of this is me having built an SDR team in Santa Cruz, California, which is <laughs> an interesting town if you've never been. Um, not a ton of traditional talent there, let's say. So we had to kind of think outside the box and, and be willing to entertain a different profile of SDR. And it worked out to our benefit in enormous ways. Um, because what we... You're hiring. Yeah, we go, go back to Looker. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but to answer your question, Scott, like people, uh, we hire for, I, I, at least I, I have always hired for aptitude and not necessarily just based on experience. So I, I'm much more interested in the mindset that somebody has, the passion that somebody has. Um, and in fact, I completely stopped asking people to pitch me my product during interviews because I found it to be a completely useless exercise. Instead, I, I have them pitch me on a passion of theirs and we just talk about it. You know, I try and have them convince me that it's something that I should care about as well. And that's been way more fun and way more telling about somebody's communication skills and level of interest and curiosity and all those things. So then what happens is you have this team of very different people, very diverse people, but they're all super motivated. They all have the same mindset in common. So managing them, therefore, is, is relatively easy as long as you understand all their intrinsic motivators are going to be a little bit different. And you're going to have to understand what those things are so you can, you know, best you know, bring the best out of them. Um, and you can't manage everybody the same way. So how, how, are you, how are you managing the career paths of the SDRs? Yeah. This is a huge topic of debate. I know you posted about this the other day. I've gone on record as saying that I think the SDR job is harder than the AE job these days. Um, and I've said that the career path is there. We just don't compensate appropriately. It's true. 
therefore people have to leave the SDR career path to go somewhere else to get to particular levels of compensation. Right. So I'm, I'm curious your thoughts there. So again, and this is informed by my having hired a, you know, quote unquote off not sales profile um, of people into SDR. So I've hired roughly, you know, just over a hundred SDRs and I have helped about 40 or 50 of them graduate into different roles. And I would say of those, you know, let's call it 50 people who have moved out of SDR, less than half have moved into sales roles. Um, the, the majority have moved into operations or leadership or marketing or demand gen alliances. Even and what do you think that is? What do you think it is that makes them not, and I love this, right? I've, I've always sort of said the SDR is really like a gateway drug yes. to the rest of the organization, yep. right? Not a gateway to the sales. Like, why would you throw out some 20 something kid who's annoyed that they can't get promoted and not capitalize on all that they blame, you know? glean from talking to potential customers, learning the process, knowing the organization, being passionate. Why would you throw those people out? So what is it that you think is attracting them to the other? So roles? it's a really good question, Richard. And I think that I can't necessarily say what attracts them to different roles, except for having visibility into the fact that these pathways exist. And so me, my job as a manager is to help design side projects for this person who says, you know what? I've, I've been an effective SDR for six, nine, 12 months now, feeling good about what I'm doing. I'm efficient in my role, not worried about making my number. I have capacity now to do something else for this company. And so I then have a conversation with them and say, what are you interested in? You know, again, what, what are your intrinsic motivations? What experiences are you trying to get in your career? And then trying to help them find the right kind of side project that they can pursue that will hopefully align with those experiences. What kind of side projects do you guys offer for people like that? I, I love that you can, and you know, you guys are of a decent size that there's always something, right? Um, what kind of things do you let people yeah, do? Yeah, so there's always work to be done um, that more senior people, let's say in sales ops, for instance, don't want to do. You know, there's always some some data cleanup or some sort of operational backend work that needs to be done that doesn't require a ton of expertise uh, about how you know the inner workings of Salesforce work but they need this, let's just say, cleanse data set. And so we'll, we'll create this side project. It's not the most glamorous thing in the world, Richard, for, for anybody to do. But we say, hey, look. But it doesn't we, Yeah, we say, look, SDR, if you want a glimpse into how this world operates, take two to five hours a week and work with this manager of sales ops and take on the things that they don't have bandwidth for. And you will learn whether it's something that you like. You'll learn, of course, about the project that you're doing, but you'll also get more perspective on what sales ops is and the value it provides to the company. And if you're interested in it, you've proven to them that you have a capacity to do the work, therefore they are interested in you, you're going to be top of the list next time an opening comes in that sales ops at work. Now, I can't control when that opening comes, and I can't control if you get that job, but what I can control is that you get an interview. And that's what I'm promising you, is that if you do this work, you will get that interview. Well, they also, I mean, and, and not that people are going to do this and take it or take it away. They also just get the experience so that should they not be able to get promoted exactly. or something comes along, they now have a story to tell about their career. And it, and it speaks as much to their desire to do more, their desire to keep learning, their desire to roll up their sleeves and get dirty with some not glamorous work. Like it says a lot about that person's innate character, which I think is also very valuable, right? Absolutely. So, so I, I love that you're doing that. And I, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, so, it, it helps people. And it, well, the interesting part about it, Richard, is that the side projects they take on almost do more to eliminate potential pathways than to illuminate them. So a lot of times people will take on this, wor this work in sales ops thinking like, oh, this sales ops gig is really cool. Is this something I want to do long term? Yeah. And they're like, they get a little bit of a taste of it. And they're like, nope, never mind. That is not what hey, I thought it was. It's like, good. Hey, Pivot tables again? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're better. It's better to have figured that out now than after right. you sign the dotted line and you take the role and you hate your life for the next couple of years. Right, right. How much? How much specific training on copywriting do you think SDRs are getting right now and should get? I'm thinking of a particular person um, that I know who's in an SDR role right now. And they literally can barely string three sentences together. Like, I don't know how they graduated. Um, yeah. 
high school with the level of like written communication that they they have <clears throat> so I'm, I'm just thinking is nobody coaching this this kid and like how do you coach somebody on that it's like going back to english and grammar and stuff so I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering like how, how much copywriting um you know training should should people get we talk about selling skills all the time well writing skills are like the new selling skill totally true right so i think a lot of sales orgs are extremely deficient or do nothing in this department so i'm, I'm curious how you look at that yeah, I, I'm right there with you, Scott. I couldn't agree more. I think written communication is just as important as verbal communication. Um, I, I hesitate to say one or the other is more important. And I think that sales teams don't train nearly enough on this. And a lot of times it's because the product marketing team is so tight-fisted about how things get communicated that they try and do way too much work for the SDR teams and for AE teams. You know, they write all the email templates and they say you have to use these. And that's so bad for a number of reasons. One, the sales team and SDR team doesn't learn how to write. And two, product marketing teams don't know how to write outbound emails. So you have a lose-lose situation there where nobody is improving. Um, so what, what we try and do, the balance we try and strike is product marketing writes the snippets about the product. So when there's something technical that needs to be communicated, that comes from product marketing. It's a line or two in a eight sentence email. The other six sentences are coming from SDRs and we train relentlessly and we certify around what we call, you're probably familiar with Basho, the Basho style of writing, it's just kind of the why you, why now. We train heavily on that to say, here's how to do research on a person or on an account. And here's how to write a personalized intro and importantly, how to segue into that personalization into Clary's value prop. And then you insert your product marketing. Here's what's cool about the product. And then you give a, you know, a soft call to action. And so we, every single week we have um, power hours where people come. We force them to do research. We force them to abide by different kind of principles that we call a five by five by five rule. Five minutes of research, five pieces of information of insights that you can use, and then five minutes to write the email. And so in the hour that we do as a team, everybody writes about five emails and shares them. And then we have a Slack channel where Everybody shares everything they wrote that day, and we're constantly learning from each other that way. That's great. I, one thing I think about, though, is that um, let's say that your methodology, Basho way, right, is the right way. Um, now, let's say that we host a training today, and you know, five million SDRs get on the training, and everybody follows this methodology. And now all of a sudden, all of the messages are the same. There has to be an evolution from that. There has to be a new way to stand out. So <clears throat> how, do you, how do you kind of riff and experiment off what's working without deviating so far from the process that you screw up all your, uh, you know, all your metrics and open rates and all this kind of, kind of stuff? Because you don't want... You know, you want everybody to be good at writing, right? But there's a part of you that's like, I really hope every SDR out there doesn't do what we do <laughs> because then it's less unique, right? And it'll be more boring and cliched. So how do you, how do you innovate, I guess, in this particular area? Do you get yeah, what I'm it's, it's a good question. I think uh, kind of buried in, in my little diatribe from a moment ago is this segue between the personalization you do and your company's value prop is very, it's very important and very few people do this well. I see a lot of times people will say, hey, Kyle, uh, you know, saw that you were, you know, you own a Corgi. That's great. I wanted to reach out. Anyway, here comes my annoying sales pitch. And then they insert the annoying sales pitch. And that just like, it kills me. It's so inelegant. It's so salesy. Um, the best email I've ever gotten on the Corgi front, the email, the subject line was small but mighty. I was like, what's this all about? And then this, the personalization was, hey, saw that you're a Corgi, Corgi owner. Just like Corgis, our email platform is small but mighty. A little bit of a, a value prop for how it was useful for my SDR team and quick sign off. And I was like, that's perfect. Like, that's the kind of thing that is actually personalized and is actually differentiating and is easier to scale. Um, so if people do that, Scott, I'm not too worried about there being, you know, 5 million different versions of the same thing because by its definition, a personalized email can't be sent to anybody else and it still makes sense. It that's is one-to-one -one messaging. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's there's sort of like 
personified emails that can be sent to everybody. And then there's personalized emails that are one to one. Right. Right. Like I've, I've done experiments where I'm like, you know, I'll try to connect with a bunch of sales leaders who went to U of A and it's kind of like bear down. Right. Like that's easy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, or if I went to, you know, go after Scott's alma mater, I'd say scum devils. Right. So it would work just fine. So um, it would not work on us. What's that? It would not work on us. This is fine. Well, I'm just trying to keep them away from me. Um, <laughs> so there, there's, there's definitely a difference between personification and personalization. Very true. Right? And, and how do you do that? And I like how you sort of have your power hour, not as the traditional power hour of everybody's going to pick up the phone and call. It's a power hour of we're going to get really tight. And then over time, everybody gets that much better at doing this. They don't have to have the power hour, but then you just bring that community thing. Um, exactly. Exactly. You guys do a really good job of community, right? Like as an organization, I think it's really, I know of this, I think it's, you know, pretty well known. Um, how are you guys adapting to the whole work from home place, right? Like you guys are a decent size org, decent size sales org. Um, how, how is that going for you guys? Yeah, the first couple of weeks, Richard, were pretty chaotic where everybody was kind of scrambling and probably overcorrecting, honestly, to say, you know, we need to have team calls every day to keep engagement up and manufacture camaraderie and do all these things. And it was actually more exhausting than it was energizing because you felt like you had to be at every single one of these coffee things and lunch things and happy hours and all the different stuff. And, you know, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not, you know, talking trash about our company for having tried it. I just think it was a bit of an overcorrection. After we've settled down and we said, all right, we don't need to do the coffee thing every day, but we can do it Monday morning and we don't need to do a happy hour every day, but we can do it Thursday afternoons. And like, okay, now we have the right sort of cadence. Um, everybody understands how to be productive. Everybody has their at home set up optimized for the most part, as best you can. People are, people are fine. Um, now a lot of our workforce was, was, uh, distributed already. A lot of our salespeople are in region already and, and working from home. So it wasn't as dramatic a shift for us as it was for many other companies. But I think after the first couple of weeks of feeling it out, we've adjusted really well. And in fact, we just did a, a little survey internally that our HR team ran and 90% of people feel just as productive working from home as they felt prior to COVID. So, so goodbye. So goodbye office. Hello. Perhaps. Remote, remote work. Perhaps. Yeah. Now that said, I miss the floor. I really miss the, the camaraderie of, this, of the SDR team in particular because they were all um, consolidated in our headquarter office in Sunnyvale. And I miss that energy. It's just so much fun to be around. <laughs> I, I hope we can you know, still find the right ways to recreate that. I think there'll be lots of ways to do that. I like what you said, and I've talked to a lot of people. The two things that, you know, nobody told us what to do, but these are the two biggest things I've seen come out of this is A, we have to go through another kind of re-onboarding as an organization, right? Moving from home, getting used to this, creating this cadence of what's the right amount of this or the right too many of that, right? And then you almost got to go back to a new product market fit conversation. How does our product fit in this market? Yeah. Right? Like you're almost going not quite square one because at least you know that the product works. Right? <laughs> but how does it work now in this relation? Right. Um, so, there's, so those are the two big things that I think we all sort of, most people were just sort of like, oh, we got to look at it this way. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to see you guys ad adopt that. Um, so um, we're sort of getting to the end of, of where we are. And, you know, our, our big thing is to always turn around and ask you, you know, how can we help you? How can we help Clary? Why haven't you hired Scott and I um, for consulting? You know, that's, this is where we close. Uh, on a serious <laughs> note, where, where can we genuinely be of support to you guys? How can we help you guys? Yeah, so we, uh, I just started a project with four other people called SDR Defenders um, that I think you both would be pretty interested in. Um, we're trying to change, change the narrative around how especially more tenured sales leaders think about SDRs. There has been such a shift over the last you know, five or so years toward the SDR work being more strategic, being more quality oriented, being less formulaic, but not every sales leader has kept up with that evolution. And so we're trying to make sure that SDRs know that it's okay to use your brain. It's okay to think, to be thoughtful, to, to be a good writer, Scott, to your point. Like it's okay to do these things to find success. And we're trying to make sure that uh, sales leaders know that this type of work, this more quality oriented work that maybe won't always show up on a dashboard 
is an okay way of going about this work to penetrate top accounts, to have the right conversations, to do the things that actually impact revenue. So SDR Defenders is a project that we're working on right now to help uh, SDRs get hired, grow in their careers, and then to help change the narrative for sales well, leaders. Let me get in touch with you. Where, where can they find out more about that? Yeah, so sdrdefenders.com is where we're, we're doing our thing. You can also follow us on LinkedIn or just follow me on LinkedIn. I, I kind of, uh, I, I try and post at least one thing a week uh, singing the praises of particular SDRs. So uh, my, uh, LinkedIn is the only social channel I'm active on. My name is just Kyle T. Coleman. Um, so check it out there and I'm happy to answer any questions if, if anybody listening has them. We'll have to uh, slowly migrate you over to Twitter. Some of us who've been been on, on, on LinkedIn for a long time now, I've gotten a little bit um, jaded or maybe a little bit bored. Uh, and so it's, we're like slowly moving to Twitter and, and, and it's like a behind the, behind the scenes episode or backstage pass to like everybody's LinkedIn. So people are like a little more, a little more grouchy, a little more so funny. It's funny you it's say kind of, that. It's kind of funny. What I like about LinkedIn though, is that it's not anonymous. I, I like that it's tied to your professional. Well, income. we're not anonymous on Twitter either, though. Well, but you can be though. You can, you be. can be. We're not talking to those people. <laughs> I find conversations on LinkedIn to be far more productive oh, than I, I do on on Twitter. Under hundred percent, hundred percent, hundred percent. Kyle, please just send Scott a link so he can get the emojis on his keyboard. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll do. If you get off this podcast teaching me this we're gonna have mm -hmm. problems just keep in mind that it's, the middle finger emoji might be the most popular one for scott there you go there you go that'll get people's attention yeah <laughs> and i i feel i would feel like i'm not doing my corporate duty if i didn't plug uh, clary a little bit if any sales leaders are listening struggling with your forecast struggling to understand what's happening with your pipeline um want an easier way to do forecast roll-ups all those things check out clary.com I think that's a totally fair thing, although I don't think anybody can predict the forecast right now. No, no, no offense to your data scientists, but very yeah. true. They're not God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Kyle, it's been fun talking to you, man. Keep up the good work. I love reading your stuff on uh, LinkedIn. I keep learning. This is going to be two things I've learned from Kyle in the last couple of weeks. I learned a PDF trick. That's right. And now I'm about to learn a, a emoji keyboard. My, this What's is the PDF like, trick before we go. No, no, you don't get to know this one, Richard. You, you, this is a me and Kyle thing. He's teaching me these, these tips and tricks, okay? I got to stay one step ahead of you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. All right, bud. Talk to you later. Bye. See you.